We just give you glory today. Father, we honor you. We thank you. We just declare Jesus your lordship in this place. We just thank you, Father, for miracles and healings. Father, we thank you for revelation, cleansing, freedom. Father God, even as we teach, Father God, I just ask, Father, that hearts will be open. Father, to receive truth. Father, that a spirit of revelation would be released in this place. We just thank you, Father. We glorify you. We magnify you today. Father, we just exalt you above everything that's going on in our life today. Today, Father, anything and everything, we just uh, command our mind just to be settled in, to hear what you have to say. This, these two days, Father, ask for impartations, Father God. I thank you, Father, for courage being released to your people, for strength being released to your people. Father, even a greater dimension of truth and understanding. And Father, we need you. We need you, Holy Spirit, to help us. We need you, Holy Spirit, uh, to bring understanding to us as a people concerning, Father God, the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. Father, concerning our authority, concerning how to work together. Father God, concerning how to help people, Lord God, help the soul of man become whole. Father, we need understanding in that area. Father God, I just thank you, Lord, even as we uh, teach today and break and come back and teach again all three sessions. Just let them build, Father. Just let them build. And we just give you the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we, we see that you have your uh, syllabuses here. And so we will pull from that. We will also um, probably be pulling from these handbooks, uh, bloodline handbooks, and, and they're back on the table some things out of that even though we have just a simple outline we just like we're just going to be spirit led today and so at the close of this teaching um we will have question and answers you know over like each session whatever's released we'll um be, be able to share and ask questions and and share things and i think that's really good because it kind of shows you where you're at and and shows us where you're at and what you need and and then we know that iron sharpens iron, right? So we want to be sharpened these two days. Yeah, we want to be sharpened. You wouldn't be here uh, in these classes if you didn't want to learn something about how to help people. And so that's what it's all about is uh, the Lord being glorified and helping people be whole. And so if you, have, if you have never been to a cleansing, we do have a little cleansing foundational booklet for you. Uh, if you have one, that's great. But if you don't, because I might pull something out of that. So we're just going to uh, just be led. And so on page one here, you know, people ask all the time, you know, where did evil come from? You know, where, where did uh, demons originate? And so just from reading some uh, theories and some commentaries and some different um, books and things, this is my belief system right here. All right, the origins of demons, and so we're going to walk through some scripture on that and just get right into their nature and how they function and all of that. And so we know uh, that Satan was a created being, an angel. He was an archangel, and we can go to Ezekiel 28 first. Um, some of these scriptures I'll pull out, the rest of them. You need to take these little booklets home, as simple as they are, and you need to just read, look up all those scriptures because there's a lot in, in there. And you know, any time that we teach in this house, it's word. And so you're going to get a lot of scriptures. And so in Ezekiel uh, 28, verse 14, it says, You were the anointed cherub who covers, and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the th stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence and you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you as profane from the mountain of God, and I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I put you before kings that they may see you. The multitude of your iniquities and the unrighteousness of your trade, you profane my sanct your sanctuaries. Therefore, I've brought fire from the midst of you. It has consumed you. And I have turned you to ashes on the earth in the eyes of all who see you. So you can continue to read and before and after in that, but... 
I do believe that he was Lucifer and he was cast down. And we're, I know we're all in agreement in that, uh, into the earth realm. And so he lost his glory. And so the Bible says that, you know, in other areas that uh, war, he was the worship angel, that there was pipes in him and all of those things. He was so magnificent and beautiful, probably the most beautiful of God's creation. And he was um, puffed up in pride and iniquity was found in him and he got uh, dethroned from where he was. But he wanted to be like God. OK, big no, no right there. And so anyway, he was kicked out. So Satan was a creative being, an angel. He got lifted up in pride. He wanted to be worshipped and be like God. And that's Isaiah 14, uh, 12 through 14. He was cast out of heaven. And that's Ezekiel 28. And then you can read Luke 10, 18, Revelations 12, 9. All of these are in your booklet. He influenced one-third of the angels in rebellion with him. Let's go to Revelations uh, 12. So he didn't, it wasn't just him that was in rebellion, but he influenced some and he took some with him. And so in Revelations 12, 3, it says, and then another sign and appearance in heaven and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and on his heads were seven diadems and his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them into the earth and the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that she gave birth and might devour her child. And so um, there was, you can read that whole chapter is awesome, but it talks about a third. And so they do believe and I believe it that a third of the angels fell. And so we're going to go into Ephesians in a minute. So angels usually operate in the heaven realm. Angels have wings and they fly, according to Daniel 9:21. Many of the angels seem to be judged to hell, Jude 11, 6, 11, 2 Peter 2, 4. There are some that are shackled and chained right now, unable to be released, okay? Only um, God has, God is in control he is in charge amen of all of those things however some are still joining satan in the battle in the heavenlies and so there are some for whatever reason god chained some some are free that's god's business amen and so in ephesians 6 12 it says for our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers against the powers against the world of forces in this darkness against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places and so the word wrestle in Greek means a struggling, a hand-to-hand -hand fight. The Greek word against, uh, P-R-O-S, forward positioning, is a face-to-face -face encounter. This means that we as people in the earth are in a spiritual hand-to-hand, -hand, face face-to-face encounter with the spirit realm every day. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there, okay? And it influences the works in the earth, Okay, so there, and we're going to go there in a minute. This list Paul gave us is the level of darkness that operates against us, against humanity, against the earth. They have a job function, and we need to give people grace to be set free from darkness and its influence. And so when you're talking about, the first thing he mentions is principalities, beginning, origin, first ruler, and authority. And so you see in this, when Paul's talking, these words have ranking. These words have different rankings and degree of darkness and powers that have been released. And so the principalities, you could say the fallen angels. And so just because um, demons, they bring all this confusion and chaos and all of that, there is an order to their chaos. Okay, there is a ranking. There is an order. Uh, they have assignments against us, all right? And so the next word he used was powers, which is a delegated authority, the right or control in a sphere or jurisdiction. And so they know their jurisdiction. So should we. <laughs> and we'll get there this weekend. But they know their, their ranking. They know. Um, there has been many times um, in doing deliverance and casting out spirits that spirits will whimper and cry in defeat, knowing and saying that they have to give an account or they have to go and answer for what, for being evicted. So we know that this to be true, okay, that they get in trouble by somebody. It's not, a, it, you know, we, we have the authority of Christ, but they're in trouble. They get punished for what they did not finish or accomplish that was their assignment. Hmm. Think about that. 
So you wonder why when you do deliverance that the devil hates you. You wonder why that there's uh, persecution and there's opposition in your life because he doesn't want people to get the understanding and get freedom and healing. And so when you, when you sign up or when you desire to learn about deliverance, you're going to have some conflict, okay? Conflict will come. There's a tension uh, drawn to you in the realm of the spirit if you think you're going to help people get free, okay? And so the next thing is rulers of darkness of this world. And so that word there means uh, order or arrangement of world system. And that the other part of that word, kratos, is raw power and strength, meaning this raw power has been put into an order or a system. Like I said a while ago, it's not a bunch of mess and confusion. They understand. Many times even a demon will give up a lesser spirit in a person to keep the strong man in place. These things are very real. They do that because they don't want to lose the strong man in the person. And so they'll give up a lesser spirit, and, and we'll probably talk about that, but it's very, very real. So that means that they understand ranking, don't they? There w there's not a conflict in that body, in the soul of that person, when there's demonic oppression like that with those spirits. They know what they're doing. They know their assignment. And they prey on the ignorance of God's people. Okay? They know that. And so the next thing is spiritual wickedness in high places. That word means something that is bad, vile, malicious, vicious, okay? It has no regard or no respect for humanity, meaning their assignment is to oppress us and afflict us with all manner of bad, evil, vile things, cause us to suffer with no regard or respect, highly injuring and threatening the life of humanity. Demons, okay? Evil spirits, whatever you want to call them, and we're going to go there in a little bit, but... They know what their assignment is. And so Proverbs 25, 28 says, He who has no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. He must take back the authority over their own spirit, only yielding to the Holy Spirit and be a spirit-led people. That's why we need freedom. So we don't be under the oppression of the enemy. That's why we need it. And so we have to understand those things so demons defined here demons define disembodied spirit beings that have an intense craving to occupy physical bodies okay they want to occupy physical bodies they rather have a human body than remain in a disembodied condition why because they've been given an assignment from satan Okay, and they need to, they know their time is limited. Okay, they know their time is limited, so they're, they're on assignment. Their lust and evil desires can be fulfilled within a body. They want a body to do evil. They want to get, their demon is a tormentor of the mind, but he wants your flesh to sin. He doesn't want you just to sin in your thoughts. He wants your body to do evil. Okay, to act out his nature. And so they are earthbound spirits that seek to dwell in bodies. Since they are disembodied, then they must have lived in some physical body in the earth. Now, this is where it gets a little funny. Some people won't like this, but this is my uh, belief system. This is what I believe, okay, is that there was possibly a pre-Adamic race. Let's go to Isaiah 14, um, 17. Something happened. God can't even, he won't, he, there's no evil in God. Think about it. He's the original creator, right? Jesus, it says in Colossians, Jesus, everything was created by him, right? Now, something had to happen in the earth for there to be these things walking in God's earth. It's true. We, we, we showed where Satan was kicked out a third Lucifer was kicked out, a third fell. They fell down to something. Something happened. In Isaiah 14, 17, it says, Who made the wilderness like who made the world like a wilderness and overthrew its cities, who did not allow his prisoners to go home. And so, and you can read a few scriptures up, but 
we know that in Genesis 1, and you can, you can study this out, and you should for yourself, okay? Study it out for yourself. Um, in Genesis 1, 2, it indicates that there was life on earth before Adam was created. Many scholars believe there were thousands of years between verse 1 and 2. I heard a, a Jewish rabbi teach this, and I was blown away at the truth of it. I was like, it just resonated in my spirit that there was some, there was a span a spance of time between those two verses. They believe the spirits of those physical bodies were left to roam in the earth and needed a body to find expression. In verse 2, it says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. So without form in Hebrew means that the earth was lying in waste, that the earth was desolate. It was a worthless thing. It means to be uh, in vanity, confusion, empty. It was an empty place. It was a wilderness. There was nothing here. And so void means undistinguishable ruin. God wouldn't create create that without purpose darkness means misery destruction death sorrow and wickedness so God doesn't create this kind of run and destruction in Isaiah 45 18 let's walk there a minute so we have to let the Holy Spirit speak to us here <laughs> speak Lord thank God for Jesus right It says, For thus saith the Lord who created the heavens, he is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create it a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. All right. He didn't create a waste, void, dark, desolate, wilderness place. He didn't do that. And so God did not create the earth in vain or confusion or without purpose. He formed it to be inhabited. Jerem, let's go to Jeremiah 4.23. And in these books, you can continue to um, study these things out for yourself. It'll, it'll bless you to do that, okay? Because it brings some understanding of the victorious life we have in Christ. And how God has taken back everything that the enemy has stolen and corrupted. Jeremiah 4. 23 it says I looked on the earth and behold it was formless and void and to the heavens and they had no light I looked to the mountains and behold they were quaking and all the hills moved to and fro I looked and behold there was no man and all the birds of the heaven had fled I looked and behold the fruitful land was a wilderness and all its cities were pulled down before the Lord before his fierce anger for thus saith the Lord God the whole land shall be desolation and I will not execute a complete destruction. And so you can continue to read all that, but, you know, it indicates that there was a time the earth was without form and void, and there was no man in it. Something had happened. There has never been a time in history of Adam, of, of Adam, and you go back to Genesis, and God, we know he created them, it says, and he told them to, what, multiply, subdue, and replenish the re re replenish the earth replenishing means to make over i've give you authority in the earth so he had to replenish it because of this fall of satan lucifer into the earth was such a devastation and a blow we know dinosaurs were here those bones are real we know there was a certain type of people group okay that didn't look like what god created with adam we know there had to be something before that. And God is the author and the original of all creation. But something happened. And so we don't have the fullness of it. But someday we're going to know it all. Amen? Amen? I can't wait to know it all. Probably won't matter when I cross over. But right now it would be nice. <laughs> and so that the earth was void and without form. And no man existed before Adam was created. Dinosaurs did exist. We see them. Uh, during the earth in the time of Adam and mankind, yet dinosaurs, they did. I think about, I watched a, a special, just a little thought here, of when they found that mammon, that mammoth, that was frozen, had food hanging out of his mouth. Come on, what happened? That he was frozen, eaten with food hanging out of his mouth. That was an incredible documentary. So they're finding all these things and 
and these mummified beings and cave kind of looking people preserved. They were here. So there had to be a mass devastation of something was pretty massive that an archangel gets kicked out of glory and, and goes to the earth. Destruction, devastation. I could go a whole bunch into this stuff, but I'm going to stay on demons, okay? <laughs> I feel like, she's a heretic. No, but it doesn't, it, don't you feel it in your spirit? Like Holy Spirit is like, huh, okay. Because it's true. There's reasons for these things, y'all. There's reasons. And so anyway... In conclusion, the demons are disembodied spirits from a pre-Adamic race who, who look for bodies of men on earth to inhibit for expression. These spirits, at the moment of Satan's fall to the earth, came under the authority of Satan and his kingdom, those one-third hierarchical angels in the kingdom. They carry out Satan's order to enslave and destroy mankind because Satan was angry. Think about just he lost all of his glory, his splendor, everything. And so he's on assignment. And so God created Adam and Eve. Bless the Lord. And then, you know, the fall. But then he made a way out. You know, there was a curse that came on the earth, wasn't there? Came on humanity because of the sin. But God still yet. In Galatians 3.15, it says, I will, when, or actually Genesis 3.15, when the fall happened, when they sinned, he said, I will put enmity between you and your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Then Galatians 4.45 talks about the fullness of time that came, and God sent forth his son. Thank you, Jesus. He sent him in to bring, redemp to bring redemption to us and to restore all things back. And he released an authority to us. That's why we're here. He released that. Romans 5.12, another scripture says, Therefore, um, just through one man, sin entered into the world, and death through sin. And so death spread to all men, because all have sin. And so we know Jesus redeemed us from the curse, right? But these spirits look for open doors of our disobedience and rebellion to come in. Or they traffic and, tra and travel down generational bloodlines. Things that have not been dealt with. Things that, doors that are open that we have not repented from. Satan got his power in the garden because of sin. No different today. He still gets his power to come and oppress us as God's people. Or some folks are literally possessed. But that's how those demons get, um, get an access to us. And so demons have attributes of personality, and we know that. You know a spirit by its nature. Let's go to Matthew 12. Demons have a will. So they can think, right? But see, spirits have to learn. They're taught things. They learn things. They're not all-knowing. Only God is all-knowing, okay? That's why they have rankings. They have assignments to watch, to learn some spirits are watcher spirits, you know, and they will literally give information. Some of these things are learned through the generations. They've been passed down. They know that family. They know the weaknesses. They know their, their strengths and weaknesses. They know how to entice them, okay, because everybody is different. Your DNA is different. Where you come from is different, and so they know, they know that person, and so they, they want to continue. If someone gets set free, it says even that a spirit will leave them, right? Jesus said that when a demon is cast out, he roams around in dry places seeking rest, but he can't find it. And so he wants to return to the house he left. What is that house? Us. He wants to come back in to the one he left and he, because he's familiar with it. It's easy for him to work that body. It's easy for them because he knows you very true I, I know there's seasons in my life where I got demonic oppression or seduced by the devil because I had areas in my soul that were unhealed I had places already in my soul that I needed some deliverance I had I had things in me it was easy for those spirits to entice me in these areas because I needed some healing or I needed some deliverance in that area you see what I'm saying and so demons work together. They work in a nest, in a group. They don't work alone. If they have to answer to higher authority, I'm telling you, they know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. 
even even with false uh, doctrines and, and witchcraft, all that stuff they do, even false healings, a spirit can tell another spirit, let up, move, back up, or whatever. They can tell them that so that person will be deceived in believing they got a healing. But really, they're under a curse because the healing didn't come from Jesus, didn't come from the Holy Spirit, you see. And so there's false healings. Jesus said there would be those, and there's, there are. And so I told you to go Matthew, right? Matthew 12, 44. Thank you, Father. It says, it's, see, yeah, yeah, the scripture I just read. Now, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and does not find it. You know why it's not finding any rest? It has to have a body to work evil. It has to be someone. He has to open it. It has to be a sin door, and, it, and it's a hard. It's some work. If people's living holy, they can't get you. <laughs> <laughs> if you got your armor on and then they have to figure out how to and they they do all they do to get back in a body because they have to finish their assignment okay they have to do their function he says then it says i will return to my house from which i came and then it when it comes it finds it unoccupied swept and put in order then it goes and takes along with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself and they go in and live there and the last state of that man becomes worse than the first that is the way it will also be with this evil generation. I believe he, take, he puts more in because he sure don't want to get evicted again. And so he needs more power, right? He needs more strength to stay in the body. So I'm going to invite some others in. The door is open. Come on. Come on back in here. And so then, and I've seen it happen. I saw a man get uh, free of um, homosexuality, and he was living good for a while, you know, clean, and we even did the reprobate uh, cleansing on him and all of that. And I was so happy that he was free and he was doing well. But then he started being uh, lured into. It was just blatant rebellion because I said, don't be hooking up with your old soul ties. Don't be hanging out over there. Well, no, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out and win them. They're going to get saved. I said, you're not ready for that. I said, you are not ready. You are not strong enough to go back out there. Not yet. There will be a day. If you keep walking with the Lord, getting some strength, getting some muscles, right? But he didn't listen. And so he uh, went out, and he, next thing you know, guess what? He fell back into it. And I remember having to do cleansing on him again. And I tell you what, it was rough. He was like, man, that was rough. That was hurt. That was hard. I said, yeah, because you got some more, and it went deeper entrenched in you. And the devil was mad. And so I'm telling you, this stuff's real. And so when it says that they want to come back, we got to keep our life clean, y'all. We have to teach people to keep their life clean. And sometimes you do lose relationships. It's not, it's, I ain't going to tell you that it's easy. Jesus said our life can be a cross, right? Take up your cross and follow me. It hurts your feelings sometimes when people reject you and all of those things. But see, we have to tell people these things. We have to, as leaders and, and people of de deliverance workers, we have to tell people, you know, keeping your freedom is going to cost you. Freedom is free. Praise God. It's free. You know, and we, we exercise our authority. We get people delivered. But I don't go home with them. You know, neither do you. They, they, you're there for them, and you encourage, and you counsel, and you do all those things. But at the end of the day, they have a free will. Yeah. You know, you can't make them do right. And that's one of the biggest things that you need to learn with deliverance is that it is a process of healing people. It is a process of freeing them. Don't take on false responsibility. I used to do it all the time. Early in the ministry, I was just weighted with false responsibility and everybody's uh, backslidden condition or everybody that went back to sin. I just blame myself. It ain't about me. They just, they, it was their choice, right? Then I used to be like, God, did I tell them enough? Did I give them this? Did I give them that? You know, I would just beat my, and the enemy would just beat me up with feeling guilty and condemned because sometimes people don't stay. You know, but not no more. Well, I've learned some things through the last 10, 12 years is that they have a free will. I can, you can lead a horse. I said that the other night. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Amen? It's very true. And so demons have emotion. Let's go to James. Freeing somebody right now. Because you know what? Some people's cup of iniquity is not full. You look, you're looking at their life. You're like, how much more? 
how much more, how many more times you got to go to jail or how many more times you got to do this or do that. But sometimes they're not tired of sin. Sad, ain't it? Sometimes they, they're not tired. And so, you know, we love them and we pray for them. But, man, all souls belong to Jesus. They don't belong to us, leaders. They don't belong to us. They belong to the Lord. So you're just a steward of truth to them. You're a steward to release truth. You're a steward to teach. You're a steward to love and instruct and all those things. But that's it. They belong to Jesus. Thank you, Lord. James 2.19, he says, You believe that God is one, you do well, and demons also believe and shudder. You mean demons shudder? They have emotions? Yes, they do. They have emotions. And so they have an intellect. Go to Mark 1. Knowledge they have learned. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell a story here, and it's, it's a, really an awesome story. I thought about it this morning while I was, when I was waking up, but let's go to Mark 1 first. Thank you, Jesus. Mark chapter 1. Verse 23. Thank you, Holy Spirit. It says, They were amazed, verse 22, at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was a man in their synagogues with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. They have some knowledge. They have some understanding, don't they? I'm sure Satan has laid the plan out and taught them some things and told them some things. They know stuff. And then they know stuff that they've learned from us. Stuff we speak. How we live. What we say behind closed doors. Demons know. Mm, it's true, isn't it? Birds of the air, they carry things. They know. What are they carrying? Ecclesiastics 8.10, it says, uh, I think it's chapter 10.20, but it says, uh, curse not the king, not even in your thoughts. Not in your bedchamber, not in your thoughts, or a winged creature will carry the matter. What is a winged creature? A spirit will carry the matter. He's going to give some information concerning what you've been cursing. And then some little imps are going to come along to try and oppress you and get in somewhere in your life because of what you've been saying. So our mouth is a doorway, is it not? Our mouth is a doorway. You need to tell people that. Our ear gates, what we listen to, what we watch, that's a big one. What our eyes do. Jesus said, you know, if, if you lust in your heart, you know, you're looking, you're lusting after a woman, you commit adultery in your heart. It's real, isn't it? So we got to guard the gates. You got to teach people, guard your gates. Come on. Guard your gates from demons. Guard your gates. We have the blood of Jesus. We have Holy Spirit. Being obedient, led people, covering ourselves in the blood, living holy. Holiness is power. Forgiveness. <laughs> you got to learn to be a dead man walking and forgive every time. Unforgiveness is one of the biggest doors of demonic oppression. And so they have self-awareness. In Mark 5, 9, this legion spirit knew its, knew its name, didn't it? Mark 5, 9, when Jesus was talking to him, he, kept, he was telling the spirit, let's go and um, let's just read it. And they came up to the other side of the sea in verse 1 into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. And he had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. That's why we need authority. <laughs> right? He said, because they do. Demons do have physical strength. Mm -hmm. And different ones have more strength than others. Okay? You could have a little tiny 80-pound girl. We've seen it and done it. And had to have five folks to keep her from hurting us or herself. 80 pounds, really? <laughs> Carolyn's like, that's right. We've done this thing a long time. It's real. Okay? Thank God for Jesus and for the delegated authority, right? 
And it says, and constantly night and day he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gashing himself with stones, seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him and shouting with a loud voice, he said, what business do we have to have with each other, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. For he had been saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, what is your name? And he said to him, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he began to implore him earnestly not to send them out of the country. So that means he had a jurisdiction there, didn't he? (laughs) He wanted to stay in the same country to do what he was called to do. He had some authority. Those spirits had some roaming authority in that region. You got to look at that. Why did he say that? And he apparently wasn't done with his assignment. And also the fact that he knew who his name was and he knew how many was in there. He knew how many spirits were in there. See, you have to understand, it's, it's wide open, it's real. Just like I'm looking at you in the natural, the spirit realm, that's how it is. They can identify, they can see all those things. Thank God for gifts, right? We need the gifts of Holy Spirit doing deliverance. We need seer gifts, prophetic gifts, healing gifts. We need all of it. We need all the gifts in operation. And so the ability to speak, we saw that. I just read in Mark they have the ability to speak. And in Mark 1, 24, Matthew 5, 9, I just read it. They use the vocal cords of those they inhabit. <laughs> and it's very quite interesting, too, because sometimes the voice changes. But they're still using the vocal cords. Mm-hmm. It's true, isn't it? It's something. The demon's nature and activity. They entice. That means they tempt. The next section here. Demons intense and uh, t- tempt us James 1 14 let's go there because this enticing and this temptate this tempting can be alluring now this is what I believe you know a spirit by its nature how it makes you feel so a spirit of lust can tempt somebody or uh, any kind of a spirit of addiction can tempt somebody right some like that And what happens is that thing, when that spirit is around, it can, you can feel something. You can feel the lust. All of a sudden you're like, you start feeling something that you know is unholy, that you know is not God. Okay. You, you have a desire all of a sudden that you didn't have something has either entered your, your area something has entered it could be a relationship you have that spirit can be in someone else and you can be around them and then you get an influence of that nature or that desire can come upon you or it can be in you okay if you've not been cleansed from it or you have open doors and you're still doing stuff you're going to be in bondage right and so it says but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust And so sometimes it's within us. It is in our DNA. It is in our bloodline. That's why we teach bloodline cleansing. If there has been a familiar spirit in your family of certain things, you can be assured that you will be drawn away and enticed and fall into that trap that your ancestors fell into or your parents or your grandparents. That stuff is very real. That's why cleansing is so important. But just because you say you've been you've gotten delivered and people need to know this because i've had to help people with this you know you got set free of it you know you're not doing that act or that nature but all of a sudden you know you continue you you know it just sometimes it comes upon you around you got to pay attention when you know pay attention when you have those attacks in the night who were you with what were you doing right you got you to teach people these kind of things because sometimes it is, there is a deliverance and then there's that component that that spirit roams around and is coming back trying to convince you that you still need deliverance or that it's in you still, okay? And that would weaken your faith in God. That would weaken your faith in your freedom, okay? And that could cause you to just say, well, fall into sin, And so I'm telling you, these things are real. See, they're schemers. Paul says we're not ignorant of this devil's schemes. Scheme is a trickster, a deceiver, right? 
That's what they do. They trick and deceive people into believing what? A lie. And when you believe a lie, that lie becomes true to you, and you live out the lie. So we got to, we got to, as we're getting people delivered and we're teaching them about demons, we have to make sure that they understand the renewing of their mind in truth. They got to be able to do that because you're not going to be there with them all the time. They got to discern. And so remember the temptation I just talked about, uh, 1 Thessalonians. Let's walk there. Because I've had people come and they're like, man, I had these vile uh, attacks in the night or these dreams and I don't understand because I ain't been doing nothing wrong but they just got in a you know uh, maybe a covenant relationship or they've been hanging out with some people that are not clean come on now that's that's the soul ties y'all soul ties are real mind will and emotion getting attached okay to someone else make sure they're godly covenant ones um, First Thessalonians three. I'm in second. I'm sorry. It says for this reason, then I could endure it no longer. Make sure I'm in the right one here. First Thessalonians three three. Okay, go to three, so that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we have been destined for this for indeed when we were with you we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer affliction and so to came it came to pass as you know for this reason then I could endure it no longer I also sent to find out about your faith for fear that the tempter might have tempted you and our labor would be in vain the devil's always going to be out doing his job Okay, he's always going to be. He's not going to stop till God deals with him in the end. And so they tempt you. They deceive you. First Timothy 4, 1. Let's walk there. These are all Christians. Hmm. These are believers. He's telling them something. This ain't, this ain't people out in the world. These are people in church. First Timothy 4, 1 Timothy 4.1 says, But the Spirit explicitly says that in their latter times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. Hmm. So it's true. That's where we're at today. Because Satan offers them something better, they think. He entices them to something better. There's nothing better than the Lord. And so they enslave people. Romans 8.15. So demons are a tormentor of the mind. But we see that they get into our bodies. Hmm. They get in the flesh. That's a lot of people uh, struggle with that because they say, well, they're possessed then. No, not if they have the Holy Spirit. I don't, I don't believe possession, in my opinion, and my belief system, if possession is you don't have the Spirit of God. <laughs> there's no Holy Spirit in you. And so in our booklet, there's a three parts, spirit, soul, and body. In your spirit, when you become born again, old things are passed away, all things become new. But there's still a purifying process. There's still consecration and being made holy in the area of the mind, okay? And so in Romans 8, 15, he says, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption, he said, as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. And so we receive the Holy Spirit. And so we don't have a spirit of slavery or bondage. And so if I have bondage, let's go to Romans 6 and areas, <clears throat> or 6, 12. He's teaching here. He says, Therefore, do not... <clears throat> Let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust and do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. He said, for sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Thank God for freedom, right? He says, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? May it never be. He says, do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, 
either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. He said, but thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. <laughs> Praise God. And it goes on to tell you that there, there is a freedom that comes. And he says in verse 22, but now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God. See, being spirit led, spirit filled, having God uh be your lord you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome eternal life amen see that's the goal right there to get people there right and so when you have areas of enslavement in your mind or your physical body you know you need some deliverance people need deliverance okay and so they torment people second timothy 1 7 um, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and what? A sound mind. So I should, as a believer, we should not have a tormented soul, a tormented mind. And so many times, you know, we, we, we understand that those spirits are, they're tormentors of the mind. So when they're stealing your peace, you know, and they oppress you and steal your peace, there is freedom for that. There's freedom for mental illness, praise God. There's freedom for all of those uh, diagnoses and things that they put on you. You can be free from the chatter. You can be free from depression and all those things, amen? And so they drive us. They, demons will compel, and they're very compulsive. Hmm. You ever see somebody like that? Very compulsive? Uh-huh. Compel you? Why? Because they're in control. They have control, but you don't have control of your own spirit. There's no peace. There's no rest. You're not doing what you want to do. You're just, it's just no peace, no rest. Luke 8, 29, it says, For they had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it had seized him many times, and was bound with chains and shackles and kept under guard. And yet he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. You see that? He had no control over his own will. Help us, Lord. They defile people. Titus 1.15 says there's a defilement that comes. I'm just walking the word with these. And I keep repeating it because, you know, there's a big argument. Christians can't have demons. Well, yes, they can, and they do. Thank God for deliverance. Deliverance is the children's bread. I'm a child of God. In Titus uh, 1 15, it says, To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their mind and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God. Now, you see that? That's talking about believers. They profess to know God, but by their deeds, they deny Him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. <laughs> wow. So there's fruit, right? Fruit we should see of holiness, of freedom. They steal your peace, and we read that in Mark 5, 15. They invade your thoughts. Hmm. Demons invade thoughts. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 10. This is a scripture that all your people that you're working with ought to, ought to know it, ought to understand it, and ought to memorize these. Because this is a wonderful example. He says in verse 3, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. For we are destroying speculation. That word speculation means a considering. Mm -hmm. You know how when the enemy throws a thought and people begin to consider and contemplate and think about, hmm. So we have to destroy those thoughts. And every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking captive every thought, or we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And then we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. So there is an authority, there is a power that we get when we overcome <laughs> in, a, in an area. And you'll see that when people get deliverance in an area and they walk in that freedom, boy, they got some power against that thing. They can punish some things right here. And they can help 
other people when they maintain and they've overcome they can begin to release the same powerful uh victory to other people right because they under they got an understanding here and so thank you jesus and so they need to learn this scripture right here demons attack us physically luke 13 80 percent um probably more than that but a lot of sicknesses are spiritually rooted and so when, when you'll find even doing deliverance with people have infirmity spirits, but then there's people that have sicknesses and diseases, okay? And so you need to be seeking the Holy Spirit on the root issues. And we've got some of that in here and some resources, but you need to get the root issue of that thing. When I say root issue, what kind of spirit is behind their affliction? And so we can, as deliverance people, we can keep trying to minister healing and we'll find that if they have a spirit in there that a root of it is a demon then they'll either lose their healing okay it won't stick or you'll continue to release healing and nothing is happening they're not getting healed usually there's a spirit behind that and so if you do the deliverance first and then release the healing because healing and deliverance works together emotional healing soul healing and physical healing all works with deliverance that's why deliverance is so important that's why it's been the most misunderstood and fought uh work of jesus in the body of christ i mean it people people agree with you about healing but start talking about demons or start talking about deliverance hold up now you know they don't want to talk about that but yet we have a church you know in the united states and abroad that are so full of diseases and sickness and suffering because demons have legal access and entry and the the people perish for lack of knowledge and so demons continue to rule and and rampant and, and run people in the church and keep them in bondage because we don't want to talk about demons or we don't want to talk about deliverance we don't want it's too messy and you know we don't we don't like what it looks like that's that's pride y'all that's pride you know and that's one of the biggest issues with deliverance ministry you will be attacked when demons manifest when you're casting them out and the attacks will come from the religious and the prideful people spirits of religion hate deliverance pride will, is a resistor why because it is a direct uh, conflict out in the open light and dark clash and guess who wins light <laughs> and so why wouldn't the devil not want it to be seen why wouldn't he try and stir up confusion and false teaching and false doctrine concerning deliverance because he doesn't want it to be exposed that he is defeated you see what I'm saying? And he doesn't want the people of God free or anybody because he loses ground and territory. And so for years I was always attacked because people cough something up or people, you know, stuff happens and manifestations. And so, you know, I went through all that, but it don't even matter no more. You know, in the early years it was a little, you know, rough, but now it's a big deal. This is how it works, you know. Why? Because it is the model of Jesus. It is the model of Jesus. He is the best and only perfect model that we have to go by, right? And so always remember that because you will be, when you have a, a gift um, of authority or spiritual giftings, there will always be a temptation that will come from somebody or some, somewhere that will try and lure you or tempt you off the narrow path. It will happen. Just throw that out there. That ain't in your book, but it's true. There will always be some somebody or something. It could be money. It could be influence. It could be um, relationship, something. Something will be offered to you to compromise the truth, to compromise the purity of what you're doing. And it can come from people that you least expect. So you need to feel the Holy Spirit strong on that. It is reality especially if you have a uh, power gifts or you know and i say power gifts because it is a gift to cast out devils i believe it i believe it's an authority and anointing from the father right and so he jesus releases that and so remember that always look to jesus and so they invade your thoughts we said that they attack us physically we we, we were going to luke 13 11 it says and there was a woman who for 18 years had a sickness caused by a spirit. And she was bent down double 
and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and he said to her, Woman, you are freed or loose from your sickness. And then he laid hands on her and he immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. So that's the great example of healing and deliverance working together. Amen. Jesus identified, he discerned, he knew, of course, full, full of every uh, fullness of God, that she had a spirit. 18 years she was sick. Wow, that's a long time. Bent over cripple until Jesus came and said, hey, cast the devil out of her. And then he released healing, anointing in her body. And so when a demon is in a body, you have to remember this, healing is always needed. I believe in the area of the soul and in the physical man because if you had a demon an infirmity lodged in an organ or or lodged in muscles or you think about like fibromyalgia a lot of people get free of that they need that they need freedom from the spirit that is in that that fibromyalgia spirit and I'll throw this out here anything that is a syndrome that they don't know what it is and doctors are like trying to diagnose that thing you can you can bet that that is an infirmity demon okay and so i treat syndromes as spiritual conditions that's that's what i believe that's what we've exercised and it's been very effective and so if they don't know what it is you can you can guarantee and even if they give it a name that's what you call it to deal with it and so many times we will use um what a diagnosis from a doctor and the names and the things that they say about the illness or that and we that the symptoms are spiritual (laughs) and so we can call out the symptoms of that syndrome or that psychological condition okay how it makes them feel we do that and then we release healing the healing oil of holy spirit the oil healing isaiah 61 Isaiah 61, 1 through 4. You need to get that in you because Jesus quoted again in Luke 4, 18. Let's read it. And so we do that. We exercise. We cast the demons out, but we always release healing oil, healing into the soul. Every place that was fractured or fragmented, people go through trauma. They're going to be fractured. They're going to be fragmented all over. We, God binds back the broken heart. He brings them back. He makes them whole. But you got to speak those things. You are the ambassador of Jesus. <laughs> you're the deliverer you're the healer with Christ in you so you have to understand these things and so Isaiah 61 says the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to prisoners to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn to grant those who mourn in Zion giving them a garland instead of ashes the oil of gladness instead of mourning the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting so that they will be called oaks of righteousness the planting of the Lord that he would be glorified amen love those and then he goes on tells them what they're going to do and this whole chapter is beautiful chapter here but he said the spirit of the lord is upon me is the spirit of the lord upon you yes so he has called you and he has anointed you and then to come to a deliverance training you have a desire by god you have a you have a desire you have you want to see god work through you to restore souls amen praise god and so healing and deliverance remember either whether it's the mind or um you know soul wounds or physical health like i was saying if a demon is in the body or in the back you know we can cast out um spirits and bones we do that a lot god that we see bone miracles and so say if someone has had demons in the bones and curses and stuff in the bones god releases the curse he breaks he looses that thing so when you bind it you're making that spirit inoperable okay you're binding it up but that's not enough and so today you'll see a lot of times people say i just i break it or i or they'll say i bind it but then they don't do the second part which is to loose it remember he says i give you keys to the kingdom what you bind and loose loose is destroying it is dissolving it like jesus said woman you're loosed from this infirmity and so you're then that loosing is a release of it it's not just bound and 
you know, not, but it, it has to leave, and that's what we want. And then we want to release healing like Jesus did because your body's going to be stiff. You could be sore. People have physical pain. We see when they get delivered from arthritis, many times there's still pain in the body. And so we call out physical pain and all of that, but we still release healing to the body. Amen? So everybody's got that now. I just feel like I need to just uh, really speak to that. And you will feel the oil release out of your hands. He said, we will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. You will feel the anointing come out and release. And, if the, and, and as you continue to grow in your authority, you continue to be a good steward with what you know right now. <laughs> you have to be a steward, okay? You have to use it. Um, we do cleansings every three months. We travel out and do them and deliverance and stuff. And everybody's like, man, you do so much. I want to keep my sword sharp. You don't think, oh, my sword will never get dull. Don't believe that. You need to keep your sword sharp. I got to keep it sharpened. I'm, you know what I'm saying? You got to keep working what God has given you, whatever it is. You got to exercise the gifts that are in you. If you don't, they get dormant. They get dormant. They'll get stale. They'll get dry. You will get dry because you're called to give life. You're called to do these things. And so it brings life to me. I could be uh, down or I could be uh, just even tired or something. But boy, after we do deliverance and stuff, even though it's, it's the virtues going out of you and all those things are happening, my spirit, man, and my heart is like, wow. All of a sudden I'm alive, right? And I feel so good. <laughs> I mean, you know, I have to rest later. But I'm saying it, it brings life to me. So when you're a life giver in the kingdom, it comes back to you. You reap, and, you reap what you sow. I'm sowing life. I'm getting life back, right? And so remember that. It's, it's, it's an honor to do these things for Jesus. And so we said they invade your thoughts. They attack you physically. They attack relationships. Boy, that's a big one. <laughs> James 3, we're going to read all those. Because there is conflict in relationships. You can bet there's demons behind it. God ordained relationships. Conflict will come because the devil doesn't want you to stay connected. Okay? And so you got to remember that. Conflicts in marriages. Anything that's a covenant. Anything that God has ordained for you to have. The demons are behind a conflict that comes. And so they want to break that up because there's power and life in that. And so in James 3.14, it says, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. Now it says, But the wisdom from above these should be our relationships right here, pure. I don't have no agenda, right? Peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. That means we have to be pure too, don't we? We got to get the stuff out. And the seed whose fruit in, is in righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And so the devil wants to attack relationships, 1 Peter 3, 7. So you've got to recognize that. Don't throw in the towel so quick. Man, people leave churches right and left. You know, people will tell leaders and some of you and pastors in here, you know, you'll hear, ah, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm, I'm working with you. I'm going to be with you. <laughs> He's like, don't they say it? Yeah. And then a the conflict comes or something is uncomfortable to their flesh or to their soul or misunderstanding. But the devil comes quick. You think watchers aren't watching that? You think he doesn't know what goes on behind closed doors and conversations that people have? And so he assigns demons to come. I'm telling you, it's real. These things are real. And they want to break up what God has joined together, what God is doing. And they don't want the body of Christ to have unity. Come on. Because where there's unity is he what? He commands a blessing. Life forevermore. Peace. Life. Abundant supply. 
And so when we have division and all these things like that, I'm telling you, it's the work of the enemy is there because there's selfish ambitions or there's pride or unforgiveness, something. Something is amiss. First Peter 3, 7, he says, Your husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. And that word weaker means physically, by the way. You can look it up. It's not talking about mentally weak, all right? I've got to throw that out there, leaders, <laughs> but because it's abused a lot, okay? But he says, look, that your prayers will not be hindered. Hmm. And so the enemy comes to what? Break up, bring disunity, bring disharmony, and he will hinder our prayers. Why? Because God, God's ears are dull. When we come to him, Jesus talked about unforgiveness and offenses. He said, whoa, more than once to the world because of offenses. He talked about even giving offerings and, and, and all of that. He said, get things right before you even sow you know, all of these things, we, we are commanded to forgive. And so when I have an ought, I got to forgive quickly. You know, when I have a disagreement, I, I'm not going to carry that thing. And I'm not going to pretend, and I'm not going to carry and pretend like I'm not carrying it, right? So we, as deliverance workers, you have to make sure that your heart is free of offenses. You don't want your prayers hindered when you're praying for somebody because you got a heart that's messy or a heart that's, not pure before God and not only that but you will have backlash okay you will have you will have a door you can use authority you can cast out a spirit and boom there's a boomerang come back to you all of a sudden you're like man what happened I just got hit by something or, or something hits my house we see that a lot when people get outside uh, their realm of authority where they shouldn't be or else they're still not they they don't have as Ephesians says obedience in that area yet but they're trying to operate over here without obedience in their own heart. And I'm telling you what, them spirits will come. Or you don't have enough knowledge yet to tackle something. You don't understand what it's connected to. Okay, the power source that that thing is connected to. That's why we don't rush into any deliverances. People all the time will try and pull me into deliverance. All the time. Just anywhere, everywhere. Not unless the Father tells me. I can I can discern them. I can discern the, the demons. I can see the demons sometimes when he lets me see them. I can feel. I have a discerning of spirits. You can see. <laughs> you can hear them. All this stuff. But if the father don't say pursue, I'm not pursuing. See, that's another challenge for you when you have authority gifts and you have anointing. You don't go just because you want you see a need. You have to make sure you're sent. Jesus sent them. Remember in Luke 9 and 10, Jesus sent them. Jesus sent them. Let's go there. Man, I've seen people get uh, hurt. People get back in bondage again. Mm-hmm. See, we have to have the fear of God in doing deliverance. Don't just get comfortable because you can. We get comfortable. We're going to get something here. We got to sharpen up. We got to hone in. We got to take every every person, too, that comes to you for deliverance. Don't just think you know what's going to happen. Oh, I can just handle this one by myself. <laughs> this is Carolyn's lane, but <laughs> that's a lie. <laughs> oh, I got this, Holy Ghost. You better, you better back up and humble yourself, <laughs> and you better get some help, right? You better humble yourself <laughs> and get some help. I don't want to work with anybody with that kind of attitude. We got this. Whatever. And so Luke 9, we have the power of God, and we have, we have prayed, and we know that God said, do it. Then I'm confident, right? In Luke 9, it says, And he called them twelve together, and he gave them power and authority over the demons and to heal diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to perform healing. Pretty awesome, huh? Demons and healing together there. And he, sent, and he said to them, Take nothing for your journey, neither a staff, nor a bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not even have two tunics apiece. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave the city. And as for those who do not receive you, he said, As you go out from that city, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. And so they did just what Jesus had said. Okay? Now let's go to uh, Luke 10. Jesus 
sends out 70 others. He said, and after that, the Lord appointed 70 others, and he sent them in pairs. You see that? He didn't send them alone ahead of him to every city and every place where he himself was going to come. And he was saying to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into the harvest. Go, behold, I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. So he already told us stuff was going to happen, right? Carry no money belt, no bag, no shoes. Greet no one on the way. And he says the same thing to them. He says in verse um, 9, And heal those who are sick and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. Now, they do all that God told them to do. And in verse 17, it says they return with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. And so then he tells them, too, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this that the spirits are subject to you but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven that'll bring you back down to earth won't it and so after great victories you have to be reminded you can't you got to be careful after great victories that pride doesn't come to you that you don't get prideful in what in, in what happened or how the enemy was subject to you in Jesus's name right because it ain't your name it's in his name and so that keeps you humble uh, because Jesus, we know in Matthew 7, he said that even the people that cast out demons work lawlessness. And so people can work lawlessness, uh, cast out demons, and be rebellion against God. It's, it blows my mind, but it is true, okay? And so Jesus gave them authority, but yet he told them where to go, what to do, and how to do it. That's what I'm talking about being sent, right? When, when he sends you or he calls you to this kind of ministry, he gives you the authority and the license by the Spirit of God to do that. Amen. It's awesome, isn't it? And so he's always the boss. Amen. And so they resist and they oppose. Demons will resist and demons will oppose the work. Matthew 13. <clears throat> Matthew 13, 9. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Or 19, I'm sorry, that's good too. <laughs> it says, the sower, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom seed was sown beside the road. And so this whole parable talks about that. So the, the enemy will always try to resist and oppose. And even in this parable, it talks about different kinds of soil, different kinds of ways when the word comes, that the enemy comes to steal. He comes to, uh, you know, kill and destroy, right? And so he doesn't want the seed of truth to be planted in people's hearts. And so deliverance gets the soil of people's hearts clean. It gets the ground good. Um, I remember years ago getting a word about, um, they were saying, you're the one that goes in and, tears up the ground and pulls and gets rid of the rocks and <clears throat> dreams about like bulldozers and plows and what is that doing deliverance it's getting rid it's getting the soil right you know jeremiah 110 it's getting the soil right it's it's uprooting things that are keeping people from deeper intimacy with jesus and their purpose or their destiny or keeping them from having peace or good health that's why it's so important and so you see why the devil would resist and oppose it. Amen. And so the next, they pervert the word and seek to hinder the gospel. We read that one in 1 Thessalonians 2.18. <clears throat> they blind the minds of unbelievers. There's blinding spirits. You need to consider those praying for people and ministering to people as deliverance workers. There's blinding spirits. That's their assignment deceitful deceive people there are blocking and hindering spirits all on their own that's their assignment blind block and hinder okay and so you need to remember that and sometimes if you have a person that you're working with that just can't see can't hear just you're like will they ever get it lord 
you need to you need to pray into that are they blinded mm -hmm. all right because let's go to second corinthians 4 let's read that scripture so we have to bind blinding spirits that should be in a in our regular prayer time for people second corinthians 4 4 or 3 says well for one, therefore, since we have this ministry, as we receive mercy, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. False doctrines, false teaching, blinding spirits. You try and minister to somebody to get about healing, and they've been taught that God don't heal today. And so they're blinded in that area. See, what I find in, the, in, the, in the people's souls, they can have freedom in one area and be bound and shackled in another. They can have a revelation in this part of their soul and the other part of them is dark and blind and they can't see truth in that area. There's, a, there's spirits working, okay? They're working in that area. Thank you, Father. They hold people captive. Demons will hold people captive. And that's your scripture, 2 Timothy 2.26, uh, 1 Timothy 3.7. We talked about they seduce people. Mm -hmm. Sure do. Let's read one of Timothy's, 2 Timothy. At least one of these references with these because the word of God is teaching us. 2 Timothy 2.26. He says, if you go up to 19, nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his and everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. So we have an obligation, don't we? Now in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and earthenware, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Then he goes on, he says, flee from youthful lusts that pers and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, and those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart, but refuse foolish and ignorant speculations knowing that they produce quarrels the lord's bond servant must not be quarrelsome but be kind to all able to teach patient when wronged with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition if perhaps god may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of truth now look what it says and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Church people hmm, can be snared by the devil, caught in a trap, taken captive in an area to do the devil's work within the body of Christ. That's why we need deliverance. That's why we need to line our lives up with truth. And see, your soul will be in conflict with the spirit, right? It's true. There will always be a, a war there. And so that's your holding people captive, seducing people. They promote fear. They oppress people. Acts 10.38 says that about Jesus, that God anointed him, and he went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed by the devil. They vex people, feeling uh, painful feelings, passions, and, and sufferings to harass them. Very true. Vex you. Ever feel vex in your soul sometimes? You can bet there's something behind it. Okay? Oppression. And not only, it doesn't mean that it's in you. It means you can discern that in atmospheres. You can go through something. It can just weigh on you. That's how I describe it. And especially during deliverance, you'll have times even before meeting or before, you know, sessions or we do cleansings, there'll be, you know, 
there'll be a week or so of vexation. You say, well, that shouldn't happen to you. It's real. There'll be, I don't speak about it and I don't give place to it, but there'll be some warfare that comes against the mind. There'll be mind battles, right? Uh-huh. Mind battles. And then uh, we're blessed to be a church that operates in these things. So we're, we're married to some adversity. We just know it's going to happen, but we just walk through it because we are overcomers. <laughs> We stand in a place staying seated with Christ, and we know that we're being obedient to God, and we are overcomers. Amen? And so we don't pay attention to it, but we do. you can obviously know that it's there. And so demons affect the personality. Let me see here. We're almost through. We're doing great. Demons affect the personality of the mind, will, and emotions. Okay? Demons affect the personality of the tongue, how you speak. When people have demonic oppression, you all know, things are going to come out of their mouth that wouldn't normally come out of their mouth because demons use their tongue to do evil. They use their tongue. The Bible says it in James 3. Let's go to James. You can tell when someone needs cleansing, there is a deliverance that needs to take place in the mouth. Tongue. Mm Mm-hmm. Because we've allowed the devil to use our tongue for so long. In James chapter 3, he says, let's go to 2. It says, for we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Then he talks about if we put bits into the horse's mouth so that they will obey us, we direct the entire body as well. Look at the ships also though they are so great and are driven by strong winds are still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires so also the tongue is a small part of the body and yet it boasts great things see now great a force is set aflame by such a small fire and the tongue is a fire the very world of iniquity hmm this is this is talking church people here (laughs) iniquity means it's bent on evil it's perverse Okay, help us, Lord. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. Then he goes down. I know it's something, ain't it? He says in verse 8, he says, No one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. And we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing, my brethren. These things ought not to be this way. Does a fountain send out the same opening, both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives or a vine, produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh. And so that's some serious teaching right there, but it's very, very true. And so we find even with deliverance, when people can't hold their tongue, there's some people, they'll debate you, they'll argue with you, okay? It says there that it is, that it is a world of iniquity. So there is a stronghold on the mouth, and we do that many times as directed by the Holy Spirit, even in our cleansings. Uh, certain churches have issues greater than others in these certain areas, right? And so with the tongue, we break curses off the tongue. Out of the tongue comes gossip and slander, uh, death, poison, uh, iniquity, all of those things. He tells us what's in the tongue right there. And so um, it's very real. Profanity. You know, you ever be around somebody and and all that comes out of their mouth is filthy profanity. They can't even do one sentence without profanity. There's a spirit of profanity in their tongue. That stuff's real. It just bubbles up. I mean, every word, every other word is a cuss word. That's not normal. (laughs) You know, and you say, well, they're probably not born again. But even in the church, people just say whatever they want to say. You know, people can't control their gossip. They try and do right. They repent. But I'm telling you, they need deliverance from the spirit of gossip. They need the curse broke off their mouth. Because I'm telling you, this is a gateway. This is a portal. And we want the power of God. We should, we're should. we supposed to be able to decree a thing and it can be established. But do our words have integrity? 
is our tongue able to speak what God speaks, right? And so those are just some thoughts, but it's very true. You'll see that with the tongue. Um, also, the demons affect the personality of uh, sexual desires. Very true. In that area, there's always going to be a fight. If there's uncleanness in that area, there's always going to be uh, impure thoughts and all of those things, desires, activities um, that cause bondage. And you'll find after, you know, of course, we know when the demon uses the body, then he brings shame. Then the spirit of shame comes and this condemnation comes if you know Jesus and then guilt comes and all these things, oppression comes upon you. Why? Because demons are using you. That's, the, that's what they give you back. That's your reward for a momentary, you know, fix or whatever you want to call it. Then comes that, that stuff. Physical appetites, also addictions. And so demons affect the personality, mind, will, emotions, uh, addictions, physical appetites. It's very real. I think that's, uh, I believe that's why God took me off coffee. Because, you know, not that coffee's a sin, but when you drink it three times a day or four, come on. When you, you drink it to stay going, hmm, <laughs> it's like, let's be honest. <laughs> you know, say, were you putting that on me? No. <laughs> Your walk with Jesus is personal, okay, just as mine is. That was directed to me. Okay, but I'm just sharing that with you because people think, oh, that don't matter. But if God says it matters, it matters. And so I had to obey the Lord, right? And I worked to do that. <laughs> but addictions, think about it. You know, I remember years ago, um, you know, I was addicted to Dr. Pepper. Just telling the truth. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> don't raise your hand, okay? But... Dr. Pepper and chocolate. Man, that was my favorite comfort. Every day. I mean, you know, it's like I exchanged Dr. Pepper for coffee years later. But, but I'm telling you, every day I would have one. And a big one, too. And, and, and chocolate together. And it made me happy all day. But if I did it and I was a believer, come on. Some of y'all have your own stuff. Just being honest. And if I didn't get it, you know, my body got mad. You get a headache. Come on. My body talked to me. My emotions were like, you know, man, I thought about that. You know, I thought about that through the day. Man. <laughs> There's a problem. <laughs> There's a problem there. There's a problem. So if you have a question, we're going to get to it. But it's true. It's so true about it because, you know, and this is not me putting convictions on you about anything about your life. This is just being transparent to show you how much of him do you want. And if he puts his finger on it, don't try and go to your neighbor and say, well, you know, you think this is God. <laughs> you know it's God, you know, because you want somebody to come in agreement to talk you out of it. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> the devil is a liar because it's true. We do those things. We're human. We live in this flesh body. And so we want to justify some behaviors. But it ain't worth it, y'all. It ain't worth it because, see, God has a plan. And he wants us to live long on the earth, okay? Longevity. And then he doesn't want us to have these appetites and desires for other things greater than him especially when you're working his work and you're doing the kingdom and you're an example and you're doing all this stuff and so there's something you know just throw that out there but I was in some bondage y'all I'm telling you and so three alternative phrases used in scripture to describe when a person is tormented or troubled by an evil spirit the first one is to have an unclean spirit. There's tons of references where Jesus called them unclean spirits, okay? I use that if I don't know what it is. It's an unclean spirit, okay? It's good to know the name of something. 
Holy Spirit can drop a name. He can tell you a name. You know, we, we teach uh, mapping. It's, you know, all it is is history and counseling, you know, to find out open doors. We can do that naturally. Holy Spirit tells us much through that, okay? And even if, and we've done people without any mappings, boom, brought them in, quick, you know, five, ten-minute interview, get the demons out of them. But I think the mapping is more for the person because it actually... Um, it actually causes them to seek the Lord in areas of, of past hurt and pain and to be able to identify some roots themselves, self-discovery, okay? Because we can tell people everything, but I think it's awesome that they seek God for their deliverance, that they seek the Lord. You know what I'm saying? It, it's, it's cooperating. It's very, very good. And then it's a closure, because many people with demonic bondage, you all know that they don't have a closure in an area. There's an open space, an open soul wound, a door that they need a closure. Maybe a, a death of a loved one or a bad re breakup relationship. It could be just an area where they just condemn condemnation. They can't get over. They need a closure in that area. All right. And, and it talks about, you know, James said, if you confess your faults one to another, I'll heal you, right? He forgives and he heals. And so there's, there's something to that. People argue about the mapping. People don't like it sometimes. People, the religious spirits will attack you. have been under attack for that whole word right there. But if, if he didn't say that he didn't bind up the brokenhearted and heal the soul, because people say, we don't need to know about people's past. We, people don't need to talk about their past. Well, if they're in bondage to it, then we need to discuss this, right? If they're in bondage to it as a deliverance person and worker, we need to identify the lies of the enemy. We got to bring truth to them, right? And we are not all-knowing. Holy Spirit is. God is. But we aren't. You see what I'm saying? And so... If God shows us, he shows us. And it's awesome when God uses the prophetic seer gifts, anointing gifts. I'm for all of that, of course. And he puts his finger on, he identifies it right then. But that's not always the case. All souls belong to the Lord. And sometimes God will require them to visit some things and deal with some issues, even their part in that. You see what I'm saying? It's not always someone else that uh, has done something to them it's something they have participated in. they need to recognize the lies of the enemy and how the enemy seduced them and all of that so they won't fall back in so that's my little take on that but it's very very important and so if you don't know what it is call it an unclean spirit mm -hmm. command it to go um to be another term is to be with an unclean spirit to have an unclean spirit to be possessed with the spirit and so, and we know that when a person is possessed, they are fully taken over. And you need to lead them to the Lord before you go dealing with demons, okay? You're going to wrestle forever. Get them born again. Believe God, uh, the Holy Spirit's conviction to come. Ask him, come, convict Holy Spirit. Draw them to the Lord. And everybody probably has their own methods. This is, this is how we function here. But I believe in getting people born again. Yeah. Because so, you want the Holy Spirit in there. Then people, if they don't get born again and you cast a demon out of somebody that is not born again, you're accountable for that. And you know what? They're going to leave and they're going to get a whole bunch more. And then you're the one that gave, you, you, were, you came in and you did that. And then all of a sudden, they're open to more demons. And so I will tell people all the time, are you ready to be holy in this area? You know, if you're living in fornication and you want to get delivered from all these unclean, tormenting spirits and all this stuff that's visiting you and harassing you, or that, that fornication could be a root issue to a sickness, I'm not going to work in and cast the devil out of you if you're going to go back into fornication when you leave. Foolishness. Why you don't do that? You know, and so the only time we exercise a deliverance like immediately if someone is suicidal, something like that. You know, they're coming to you, I'm, you know, I'm going to kill myself. You know, I'll put next week at, you know, 10 o'clock. Come on. They might not be here, right? And so stuff like that, that's different. You know, you got to be discerning of the Holy Spirit. And when people come to you about things, it's a very, it's so much responsibility doing deliverance, y'all. So much responsibility is connected to this. And so um, demon and evil spirit, unclean spirit, 
all means the same and are used interchangeably. Now, they could have different uh, natures, different personalities that they are different natures, different functions. But you notice Jesus used them interchangeably. Demons operate outside the body and one must keep them out. Ephesians 4 talks about give no place to the devil. Okay, James 4, 7 says you, you submit to God. You got to tell people these things. Man, you better, you feel temptation. You better submit to God. You resist the devil. He will flee from you. Give them a list. Write that down. Give them a list of scriptures about temptation. That God has made a way of escape to you. And I'll give them to you right now. I got them in here. Because they need to know this stuff. Because they'll feel defeated or feel like, oh, I can't do it. The Bible doesn't lie. You have a responsibility to keep free. You have a responsibility to fight this thing. Yes, you can call me for prayer of agreement. Absolutely. Yes, you can reach out. But there has to come a time when you've got to take authority over that tormentor, right? Uh, temptation. First, one of the, the devil uses, and it's not in there. You can write it in there. Satan uses temptation accusation and deception those are his three greatest weapons right there that he uses and everything falls in that but first corinthians ten thirteen, that's one it says no temptation but was common to man right but the lord delivers them out of them all i can stand on that first corinthians ten thirteen. write that down the next good one is second peter 2 9 it says the lord knows how to deliver them <laughs> and you can look it up in the fullness of the scripture. And then Luke 4, when Jesus was tempted, he returned in the power of the Spirit. But what did he do? He used the word of God against the, tempta against the tempter. He used the word of God against them. Okay? That's 1 Corinthians 10, 13, 2 Peter 2, 9, and Luke 4. And as soon as we're done with this, we'll do questions. 10, 13. Mm-hmm. Deception, temptation, accusation, and deception. You remember, Revelations twelve ten says the accuser has been cast down. Mm -hmm. So why do we let him get back up? He's been cast down. Remember, Jesus defeated all this stuff I talked about today. He defeated it. Thank God on the cross, Galatians. He defeated that. Colossians talks all about that. First, uh, one and two chapters. Okay, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Thank you, Jesus. And so, you see where we're at here? Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to stop right there on page 4. And, um, and then we're going to have question and answer. But we're going to shut the live stream and then... Okay. Then we're going to do question and answer and have lunch, and then we're coming back. Okay? So...